It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornsheen. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Bornsheen. I'm senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley right here at Colorado Springs. And I'm so excited that you are tuning in. We begin a brand new study today. Yes, we're going to take off on a journey that's probably going to take us about 40 weeks to get through. I kid you not, it took about 36 weeks when we were going through this in a regular pace on a Sunday morning in which I have about 45 minutes to share. And here on the radio, of course, I have far less than that. So this is going to take us a little while to get through, but we are going to be studying 1 Corinthians. And so, yes, it's going to take a little bit of time to get through, but I know you're going to be encouraged because there's so much that comes out of the book of 1 Corinthians that is applicable to our lives today. In fact, we'll talk about love. All, oh, yes, yes, indeed. The love chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts, including the hot topics of prophecy and speaking in tongues. We're going to cover that to great detail. Uh, we'll also talk about wisdom, marriage, sensitivity to others, living a life of service to God, the gift of a new body, the celebration of the risen Savior, immorality, idolatry, even how to deal with lawsuits and divisions, even issues like head coverings for women, all of that is found in 1 Corinthians. But before we get into this study, let me just set up a little bit about the history of Corinth. I'm, I'm a big history buff, had the privilege of producing a program for TBN and the History Channel called Drive Through History America and working with that team, Dave Stotts and the great team there at Coldwater Media. And I just love history. In fact, uh, many years I had the privilege of working with wall builders and Keenan Curitan over there at uh, FRC, and we're all just a bunch of history nerds. So just bear with me if I give you just a Maybe it's too much information, but I think, it, I think it'll be just right because it gives you a foundation of this city of Corinth and in the modern day city of Corinth. Now, this is, this is a city that's built on cities. In fact, its history goes all the way back 5,000 years. Around 700 BC, the city became a major commerce trade route and, and around 550 BC, so 550 BC, they allied with this with the nation of Sparta uh, within this Peloponnesian League. Now, this particular league, they they become this ally, and after this this Sparta victory during this particular Peloponnesian War, the two allies they fall out of graces with one another, and, and then Corinth is they they start to pursue this independent policy that they're no longer going to going to align with other nations and wars and so forth, but. After the Macedonian conquest of Greece, it was liberated and they, they end up joining the Achaean League. And this happens around 146 BC and Corinth was then captured and destroyed by Roman armies. Now, now Ro there was this Roman colony that's now built on it, takes place around 44 BC, and then Corinth flourishes under this new administration and becomes the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. So if you had a map there, you could see what I'm talking about, but this, this particular city then lies in this important trade route. And it's actually a very interesting position. It's about six miles to the southwest of this narrow four-mile-wide isthmus that separates Corinth from two gulfs. And so this particular isthmus would be a lot like uh, what, we, what we see with a perfect positioning uh, for a canal. And when the Romans took control of Greece, Tiberius, the, the, the reign of Tiberius during this time, the engineers then tried to dig a canal and, and they were unsuccessful. So what did they do? They decided to build this like an ancient Egyptian device where the boats were rolled all the way across the landmass. Okay, so you've got this four wide, four mile wide isthmus, and rather than finishing the canal, they decide to use all of these logs and roll the boats from one side to the other. And that this was in use uh, by 32 A.D. And in fact, in 67 A.D., the Roman emperor Nero had ordered 6,000 slaves to then go ahead and dig the canal. Now, following Nero's death, 
his successor goes ahead and just abandons the project altogether because it was too expensive. But yet, because of their work to try to dig this canal, they they continue on. And in fact, in 1830, uh, there was a real serious uh, look at building the canal, and, and they proceeded. And it wasn't until 1893, after 11 years of work, this is 1893 A.D., mind you, they finally finished it. So after all these years, for almost 2,000 years, this idea of a canal... Uh, being built across Corinth finally came to fruition in 1893, but had been used in the very same way, a trade route between the gulfs. Now, Corinth was really had, had a, re- a bad reputation. It was something as proverbial reputation for sexual promiscuity. It was a, a hotbed of immorality and vice. In fact, Corinth was a place of religious variety, polytheism, which was the worship of many gods and goddesses from both Greek and Roman cultures alike. They had their local deities and heroes that they would worship, the, the divinities from that would come in from the east even, and all these Egyptian deities, Isis and Serapis, Amongst others, they just worshipped everything. And in 1858, it was totally destroyed by a 6.5 earthquake. And yes, that's a magnitude 6.5 that we just saw in California not too long ago. And yet this particular magnitude earthquake was enough to wipe out the city. In 1928, another earthquake of 6.3 magnitude destroyed the new city. And in 1933, there was even a great fire And the new city then had to be rebuilt upon that. So the city that's there today doesn't even go back to 1933 because it's there were ruins built upon ruins, built upon ruins, and and now we have the city that we have there today. So between 1858 and 1933, three times the city of Corinth was completely wiped out and rebuilt. Now Paul was in Ephesus around 57 A.D. while he was writing to the church in Corinth. And that was during his third missionary journey. It's interesting because in First John, as the Apostle John was writing, he most likely was in Ephesus as well. So we have Paul writing from Ephesus to the church in Corinth. We have John later, about 40 years later, writing to many of the churches that would be, receive the, the book of Revelation also from this city of Ephesus. So in the midst of Satan's backyard, if you will, of this the city of Corinth, uh, we see a lot of ministry that's going to be going on from there, and, and a number of churches that would be established. And so it was so important that he write these instructions to this church to get their act together, because what happened was they started to adopt many of the uh, the pagan ways into their culture. It's what they knew. It surrounded them. So here Paul is writing to them around 57 AD from Ephesus during his third missionary journey. This is roughly 20 years after his Damascus Road encounter with Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9. So you go back to Acts 19 for more detail on his stay in Ephesus that had resulted in this huge riot. In fact, they were worshiping the the deity, the false god uh, Artemis, also known as Diana, also known as Isis, also known as Semiramis, the moon goddess, the wife of Nimrod that goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. So here Paul is writing from Ephesus, this place where this riot to worship the false goddess Diana had taken place, and he's writing from there to Corinth that's also going through great pagan worship during that time. So Paul, he's about 55 years old. Uh, when he's penning this book of 1 Corinthians. It's his third letter of his 14 epistles, and I believe that he did write the book of Hebrews, as I include that in this number. So only 10 more years of service will go by for the Apostle Paul before he is executed in Rome. So he's down to his last decade. Now, of course, he doesn't know that. We know that as historians, as as theologians, as as studious students of the Word. We can look back now and go, wow, he only had 10 more years after writing that. So let's get started in this. If we were to examine 1 Corinthians from our modern era, what I'm about to tell you would sound like probably a church you know down the street, Uh, but it may even be worse than churches we know. And and we hear so many horrible things that are going on in churches sometimes, and, and that's why Paul wrote this letter to get the churches act together 
because they were falling short and they were starting to, starting to adopt the things of the world and, and forgetting their first love in Jesus Christ. So if you think about it, here's what was going on in this church. If you can imagine this with me, a church that's wrought with divisions and factions, that they, in fact, uh, favor one particular preacher over another and willing to give division to that. They're, they're a church filled with sexual immorality. In fact, some of the members were known for visiting prostitutes. Another was having an affair with his stepmother. And these believers, they don't work out their problems. Rather, they sue each other in secular courts. They're even having debates, uh, rages uh, over topics like Christian liberty, men's and women's roles, prophecy, speaking in tongues. This is dividing the church. And then you, you can almost imagine here is what he's going to talk about of how they were even defiling the Lord's Supper. They were abusing that. Now, this, this is hard to believe that they, would, they could even do something like that, but they, some didn't even believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ in this church. So the church I'm describing to you is this first century church of Corinth, a church that the apostle Paul founded. So if you're a pastor listening to this right now and you and you feel some grief of the things going on in your church, it just breaks your heart. Imagine how the Apostle Paul felt. This is a church he founded and all of the things I've just described are the things he's going to be writing about. Oh, oh my goodness, how is this happening in the fellowship of believers who, who are the, the body of Christ? Now, how he responds to this is amazing. You would think that he would respond with, with anger and, and frustration and almost an unlovable approach, but he, get, he responds with optimistic thanksgiving, that he's even thankful for this church because Paul knows that God is at work in their midst despite their behavior. And God gives his church every gracious gift and keeps his church secure in his faithfulness. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 9, Paul pins this greeting with thanksgiving to the church of, uh, at Corinth. And, and in fact, he, he cites that he is called by God. Here's what we read in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. So one of Paul's primary themes, which it, it means to it, the chapter one here, is that he, it's called. He's called. This is not something he just took upon himself. In, in verse 1 here, Paul describes himself as one who's being called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ specifically, and he forms these Corinthians that they are saints by calling. And then in verse 9, he's going to refer to those whom God called into the fellowship. In verse 24, he's going to speak of Jews and Gentiles who are called. In verse 26, he speaks of the Corinthians being called to salvation. So you see that this is a theme throughout all of chapter 1 of being called, and the idea of God's calling is everywhere in this chapter, and it's derived from the very words of Jesus Christ in John chapter 6, verse 44. We read, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So this calling is one that began before he ever created you. And we go to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30, we read, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, and those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. This is reiterated in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8, where we read that all who will be saved were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Why can we say that? Why can the word say that? How, how, how are these names preserved even before one day ever came to pass. Does that show favoritism? This is, I'm not going to get into the Calvinism Arminianism debate here, but let me take you to one verse in particular Isaiah 46 10, that God saw the end from the beginning. And, and we're even told that the eyes of the Lord examined the whole earth in 2 Chronicles 16 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Now, this knowing all before all is why the angel of the Lord would call Gideon a mighty warrior 
while Gideon was hiding from the Midianites. While he's in the midst of cowering at the magnitude of the assignment in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 to 12, God already knew what Gideon would do before Gideon was even called. And Gideon still had to answer the call and be willing to step out in faith. Now, now, whenever God calls us to do great things in his kingdom, we're, we're expecting something as obvious as like a, a redwood tree when it often comes in the form of a mustard seed, right? We're, we're expecting something extravagant and, and illustrious and a boom, okay, I can't miss that. And yet it can be even as small as a mustard seed. If we're, We often put out our, our fleece moments like Gideon, right? We're almost like we're testing the Lord to, to double check if this is from him. But you're looking for your red and blue suit with a giant S on the front when God is handing you a bucket and a mop. But in those who are willing to wash feet, he sees kings and priests who are about to inherit the universe. That's the reality of this. So it's time to step out and step up where we read in Isaiah 6, 8, here I am, send me. Now, David wasn't looking for a giant to slay. We think about King David. He, He was being obedient to the commands of his father, Jesse, to deliver dried grain and bread to his brothers, as well as cheese to the captain. You go to 1 Samuel 17, 17 to 20, and out of David's obedience, God gave him an opportunity. So so you want happiness in your marriage and your life? It begins with obedience to your heavenly father. If he tells you to carry bread, you ask how far. He might not even tell you how far. He just wants you to keep walking until he tells you to stop. So, So then watch God bring opportunities across your path. We need a here I am, send me moment. So your calling begins with obedience. God shows you first, according to Ephesians 1, 4 and John 15, 16, but you must choose to follow. As we see in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So God prepared us for good works, according to Ephesians 2.10. And when we act in obedient, selfless service, as we read in Philippians 2, 3 to 4, these services are all within our calling. And Romans 16 and Hebrews 11 are filled with acts of obedience that ultimately were acts within a calling. So think of your calling as layers, if you will. Every layer builds on the other as God actively works as the grand weaver in the tapestry of your life. So David was called to serve God. David wasn't called to be a giant slayer. His calling was to serve the Lord. King of Israel was a title. Servant of the Lord was his calling. Now, slaying giants was just an act of service within his greater calling. You see, so for for Paul, God's call to salvation and apostleship was essential to life and ministry. It reminded him that his true allegiance was to God and not to man. This gave him an even greater sense of his confidence and perseverance. So so Paul seems to feel the need to reiterate his calling often as is seen throughout his writings, even, even calling himself the least of the apostles in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, because he once, once previously in his life, he was living in opposition to the ways of God. I, I suspect many of us listening right now can relate with that. His testimony was one where God brought order and purpose out of a life of destruction. So Paul seemed compelled to remind people of his calling, perhaps as a reminder to all that he is a changed man. As we see in Galatians 1, 1 11 to 12, we read, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I never, and neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this goes hand in hand with what we read in Revelation 12, 11. We read that again. Let me read that to you. It says, And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and that they did not love their lives to the death. So have you ever considered your calling? I suspect, could it be that perhaps you've been called to ministry through your business, perhaps as a teacher or even as a homemaker? I'd argue that God has a calling for each one of you. And when we understand that we have a calling from God, we can persevere when things are discouraging and even difficult. And I encourage you to go back and read Colossians 3.23 on that. So without a sense of your calling, you're not going to last. You're not going to endure. You're going to take your eyes off the prize. You're going to give up. But if you regularly reflect on your call, God will be gracious to sustain you. Now, now don't assume struggle is evidence that you're not operating in your calling. 
when it may just require good old hard work that you that you need to endure here and experience. You see, many people today don't appreciate the joy and benefit of hard work, and, and anything worthwhile will not be easy to attain. You just ask Noah about his century project and his home remodeling project, all right, as the Lord set him to task him with building the ark. If you ask Abraham about his relocation efforts and his hike with his son, I, I know you're going to find that story fascinating as well. Even Joshua and Caleb about their journey from Jordan into Israel or Nehemiah about his construction plans. How about Paul about his boat trip? Nothing worthwhile comes without sacrifice. And yes, even stress or pressure. But believe it or not, you're better under pressure. Only God can show you how to convert the pressure into something glorious. If you think about it, we, we love looking at diamonds, especially ladies. I know gentlemen appreciate a good diamond as well. But this graphite or various carbons are compressed to over 1 million pounds per square inch at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit in order to give us this illustrious, beautiful diamond. If you think about hydraulics, Pascal's law of the principle that states that for every incompressible fluid at the rest, the difference in pressure is proportional to the difference in height, and this difference remains the same whether or not the overall pressure of the fluid is changed by applying an external force. Now, what that means is that by increasing the pressure at any point in a confined fluid, there's an equal increase at the other point in the container. This is how you get hydraulics. You apply heat and pressure, and when you do, hydraulic oil is able to lift thousands of pounds by simply applying more heat and more pressure. It can lift far more than it can do in its own. It's like what we look at uh, 211 degrees at water. If, if it's just 211 degrees, it's hot. But at 212 degrees, it's boiling. And boiling water produces steam that can power a locomotive. So that one extra degree makes all the difference. And, and you're like a steam engine. But some of you blow your top instead of applying the pressure to God's purposes. So, so you got to cast all this stress on the Lord. This is why God tells us to cast our anxieties and worries on Him in Psalm 55, 22 and Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34. It's not if you're going to be stressed, but when especially as you face struggle, even when operating in your calling. Let's read 1 Peter 5, 5 to 11 on this. He says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. You, you want to operate in your calling? Then you must humble yourself before God daily. And this requires prayer and lots of it. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 on that. And we must cast our cares upon him. And then we put on the armor of God from Ephesians 6 and get to work. So if you lack vision or understanding or wisdom, ask for it. Habakkuk 2, 2 to 3 tells us to do that. If we're looking for vision, ask him for it. And then when he gives it, you write it down and you run. Go back to James 1, 5 also on that. God will answer if you are patient. And God may be testing to see if you want his way or your way. Go to James 4, 3 on that. Let me just read to you this, 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember the story of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, the four men who took the paralytic man to Jesus for healing in Capernaum, they weren't detoured by the fact that the room was filled. Oh, no, they go 
up on the top of Peter's house. They make a hole in the roof. Now, can you imagine that this is Peter's house and how burdened he was? He, he, he's making sure to tell us that they took and pulled a, a whole part of my roof off, and Jesus is there teaching, and they're pulling his house apart so that they can complete their mission. So, so when you're doing the work of God and the opposition increases, we must rise up and go higher in the strength of our Lord. If something is hard, we tend to see it as a stumbling block, as though God is trying to close a door or, or as we're trying to push it open. And then someone with the best of intentions comes along and tells you that God won't give you more than you can handle. And that's it's not scriptural at all. And we're going to address that when we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which we'll follow up by reading 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul specifically declares that God does give you more than you can handle. Noah couldn't handle the flood. Moses couldn't handle Pharaoh. Deborah couldn't handle Sisera. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego couldn't handle the furnace. Daniel couldn't handle the lions. And Stephen couldn't handle the angry crowd. The Bible never paints a picture that you're able to handle anything without God. Jesus says in John 4, 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. So when someone is laboring for Christ and they're calling and they're calling and their world seems to be falling apart, don't tell them that God won't give them more than they can handle. Rather, you encourage and pray for them as Paul prayed for us. He says, for this reason, in Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, he says, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the family, the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes, which surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to ex do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now we're going to continue in our study of 1 Corinthians. You see, we haven't even gotten out of verse 1 yet. That's why this journey is going to take us a while, over 40 weeks. I know we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, but you will be blessed by this journey, and I'm so excited that you're along the journey with me, and I hope you're blessed by all that we read here. It's not my words. I'm simply the messenger. These are the words of Jesus Christ our Lord through the Apostle Paul, and I know you're going to be encouraged. If you need a, a place to come and worship, to go deeper in the Word with other believers, believers who know your name and want to go deeper in the Word with you, please check us out at calvaryfountain.com. This is a ministry of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley. Services are at 10 a.m. on Sunday. And again, our website is calvaryfountain.com. God bless you. We'll see you next week.